Yeah. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Uh, My name is Christine Allen, and I'm the president and co-founder of Afnow Foundation. We are a dementia resource center based here in northern New Jersey, and we provide supportive services to families who are living and struggling with Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. So what are the supportive services that we provide? It's actually quite a lot. We do have support groups for caregivers who are living with a loved one, taking care of a loved one living with dementia. We do what's called crisis management. Um, that is when a caregiver can be in a particular difficult situation with their loved one, and they call us and we provide some immediate feedback on what to do and how to handle that situation. Um, we also do educational um, seminars similar to this for uh, members of the community, but we also teach first responders, um, and the medical crew as well. Uh, we do a lot of professional training for professional home health care workers, social workers, home health care agencies, nursing homes, and so forth. Uh, we also do long-term care planning. So basically, when a family comes to us for support, we are with them from the moment of diagnosis all the way through to as they transition. That could be three years, it could be 10 years. So far, we're at our 10-year anniversary, <laughs> so we've actually got some clients who have been with us for, for 10 years already. Um, and then we also do evaluation testing. So that is when we do cognitive assessments for someone, anyone over the age of 60, who has memory concerns. So if they're worried about if their memory concern or their memory loss is a normal part of the aging process or something they should be concerned about, we can do baseline assessments. We are not doctors, so we do not diagnose. We are not a clinical um, a clinical diagnosis, but many of our members of the community have never had a cognitive assessment before. So many times we will be the first, um, their first step into getting a cognitive assessment. And then we also do in-home assessments. So we address and take a look at whether they have the ability to continue to live alone um, or if they need some help and, and what that would mean. So, and for all of that, we also then provide some case management which handles the resources um, that people need to stay at home, live at home, a healthy and independent life for as long as they possibly can. So I know we do a lot, right? <laughs> Every time I'm done talking about what we do, I'm like, I'm exhausted. How do we do all of that? <laughs> um, but we do. Today is our, um, in our four week series, this is our last week together. I'm so sad, um, but this is a really, really important topic. Uh, the six pillars of brain health um, this is all about how can we possibly prevent or slow down the progression of Alzheimer's disease or any related dementia. And I will tell you, right now, science believes that there are four things that could possibly be a cause for dementia. It could be, of course, genetic. It could be environmental. And I mean environment, not environmental in the fact of the air that you breathe, but more the environment that you live in your culture, your genes, and the fourth one is lifestyle. So what can, what, what of these four things can we change? Can we do anything about? Huh? Environment. environment. Some of us are lucky enough to be able to change our environment. Absolutely. What else? Right. Lifestyle. That's it. What about the other two? Our culture and genes we can't change. Okay. But so what we focus on then is since we don't know the cause of Alzheimer's disease or any related dementia, really, we have an idea of what it is. But since we don't know the exact cause, we focus on those two things, lifestyle and environment, because those are things that we can change. And hopefully with the changes that we make, we can slow down the progression of the disease or possibly slow it, stop it from happening. Who knows? We don't know. Might if we start early enough. Okay. So also, this is really casual. Okay, I want you guys to ask questions. That's really what I'm here for. I want to hear, I want to make sure that I answer the questions that you have so that you walk away here with some real knowledge. Okay, so feel free to raise your hand at any time. Um, there we go. It's not working, sorry. Is it on? It's on. Yep, got it. Great. Technology. Isn't it wonderful? Um, okay, so first of all, we're going to talk about what dementia is, 
Okay, so dementia is the loss of cognitive fun functioning that goes to such an extent that it interferes with your activities of daily living. Can somebody name a couple of activities of daily living? What is an activity of daily living? Bathing. Bathing, exactly. Eating, dressing, um, paying your bills, all of these things that we really take advantage of that we know how to do on a daily basis. In order for someone to have to be diagnosed with dementia, at least two of their activities of daily living have to be impaired. Okay. But symptoms, and this is what I really want to talk about. The dementia itself could affect your memory. It could affect your language skills, your visual perception, your problem solving. It could cause confusion, disorientation, paranoia, hallucinations. There is a myriad of symptom, symptoms that we refer to as dementia. And I want to point out a very important difference. There is a difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Does anybody know what that might be? I love to ask this question because we throw these two terms around. Some doctors talk about dementia. Some doctors only, doctors only talk about Alzheimer's disease. It's very important for you to understand the difference. So we refer to dementia as an umbrella term, meaning all those symptoms that we mentioned before, self-management issues, problem solving, memory, language skills, all the symptoms of a cognitive decline is what dementia is. However, Dementia has to be caused by something. There is an underlying condition that causes dementia. Most of the time, 70 to 80% of the time, it is caused by an actual disease called Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's is a disease of the brain that affects 70 to 80% of cases of dementia, but there are actually over 105 different types of dementia. But you're only gonna hear people talk about four or five because usually that's, that's the, the top button, but there are over 105 different types. So sometimes to make it more clear for you to understand even better is think of the word cancer. When someone says they have cancer, one of your first questions could be, hmm, I wonder what type of cancer they have. This is the same thing I want you to think about dementia. If someone gets diagnosed with dem dementia, your first question should be, hmm, I wonder what type of dementia do they have? Do they have Alzheimer's disease? Like I said, 70 to 80% of dementia cases are caused by Alzheimer's. But it could also be something else, a frontotemporal disorder, which includes, again, many, many different subtypes of frontotemporal. Um, Lewy body dementia, which is just one type of dementia. We call it Lewy body, we call it dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, Parkinson's disease dementia. So most of most people that develop Parkinson's will at some point develop Parkinson's related dementia. So unfortunately, not only are, there, are their physical abilities affected, but so are their mental capabilities. Um, vascular dementia. Um, this is probably the second most, I don't want to say popular, the second most um, common type of dementia. <laughs> is vascular dementia, and that's because it's caused by a, a stroke. So when we have a lack of blood flow or oxygen to the brain, it can damage the brain and cause vascular dementia. Okay, so does that make sense? Hold on, we're gonna have a video here too in just a few seconds before you press play. Or I might be able to press it, let me try. But does that make sense? Yeah, does that, do you more clearly understand the difference what dementia and Alzheimer's is? Yeah, okay, good. So what we're going to do, I really want you to watch, it's a three minute video that's going to talk about Alzheimer's disease and how the brain damage occurs. Oops, it didn't work. I might need you to toggle over it. There should be a little thing that pops. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. Can we turn it up? Slow, fatal disease of the brain affecting one in ten people over the age of 65. No one is immune. The disease comes on gradually as two abnormal protein fragments called plaques and tangles accumulate in the brain and kill brain cells. They start here in the hippocampus, the part of the brain where memories are first formed. Over many years' time, 
the plaques and tangles will slowly destroy the hippocampus and it becomes harder and harder to form new memories. Simple recollections from a few hours or days ago that the rest of us might take for granted are just not there. After that, more plaques and tangles spread into different regions of the brain, killing cells and compromising function wherever they go. This spreading around is what causes the different stages of Alzheimer's. From the hippocampus, the disease spreads here to the region of the brain where language is processed. When that happens, it gets tougher and tougher to find the right word. Next, the disease creeps toward the front of the brain where logical thought takes place. Very gradually, a person begins to lose the ability to solve problems, grasp concepts, and make plans. Next, the plaques and tangles invade the part of the brain where emotions are regulated. When this happens, the patient gradually loses control over moods and feelings. After that, the disease moves to where the brain makes sense of things it sees, hears, and smells. In this stage, Alzheimer's wreaks havoc on a person's senses and can spark hallucinations. Eventually, the plaques and tangles erase a person's oldest and most precious memories, which are stored here in the back of the brain. Near the end, the disease compromises a person's balance and coordination. And in the very last stage, it destroys the part of the brain that regulates breathing and the heart. The progression from mild forgetting to death is slow and steady and takes place over an average of eight to 10 years. It is relentless and forgotten, incurable. Helping your family, friends, and neighbors to better understand Alzheimer's will reduce stigma, improve care, and even help the fight for a cure. Thanks for helping to do your part. Learn more at www.aboutal. Okay, that's fine. Good. So does that make sense? Yeah. Right? So you can see that progression from short-term memory loss all the way through to as we as it progresses, it can be slow. And here's the thing: the growth can continue to each section of the brain. Some damage will be greater than others. So even though you have damage in the language sector, which would be next, right? Or recognizing familiar uh, your emotion and then recognizing objects, the damage might be stronger in the area of your brain that controls your language, more so than the area of the brain that controls your ability to recognize familiar objects. And that's why we say when you've met one person with Alzheimer's, you've met only one person. Because even though the progression of damage is, is consistent, the amount of damage caused in each section of the brain is not consistent. So it's not like it damages that entire section of your brain. You don't really know how much of that section of the brain is going to be destroyed. And then to make things even more complicated, sorry, <laughs> there are some people who have what's called compensation. Their brains are able to compensate in one area for another. So if the language sector of their brain, it, brain is, is very much damaged, another part of that brain will be able to compensate for that loss. And that's what makes it difficult for us to decipher when someone actually has dementia. Because when they first start to um, get their short-term memory loss or their emotions are affected, they hide it. And they're able to hide it because their brains, another part of their brain is able to compensate for that loss over there. However, very few people are able to do that. So we don't know exactly why people have the ability to compensate. We can't predict it. We do tend to believe that people that have a difficult job and higher levels of education and have continually and always working on their brain power, so to speak, which is what I call it. When you're constantly learning something new and you have a very difficult job, you're continuing to build new neurons. We don't, we never stop building neurons. The, the build, the growth just becomes very, very slow as we age, unless, unless we make our brains work for it. So that's why we believe that people that do have a really hard job, a difficult job, not a stressful job, but a difficult job, um, and have a higher level of education might be able to compensate more than others, okay? We have a few statistics here that I thought was kind of interesting. 
Alzheimer's disease is the seventh leading cause of death in New Jersey, but the fifth for women in New Jersey. Yes. Uh, you have some examples of what I think was out there. Yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. I cannot think of anyone um, except maybe um, a florist. No. <laughs> the thing is that we're all, we all we all have stress in our lives, um, and we we all handle stress in a very different way. I'll give you a little trick though. The people who are able to cope with their stress and or cope with a trauma that occurs in their life. And we're all gonna have traumas in our life, right? Our parents are gonna pass away and we're going to lose friends. We might get in a car accident and so forth. How you deal with that trauma can also be an indicator of whether or not you will develop dementia. So it's, it's good to be mentally strong, right? It's good to be able to learn ways to cope with stress and to deal with our trauma. Um, it'll lessen your risk factor for developing dementia. But not easy. Not easy at all. Yeah. So as I said, it's the seventh leading cause in New Jersey of death, but it's really the fifth leading cause for women. Because, you know, women, we have that higher level of stress usually because we are the caregivers at home and we're taking care of our parents, but we're also taking care of our children, right? So, and we're working. So we tend to have a little bit more stress in our lives than we've met, but not always. So not always. Um, also, someone in the United States develops Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's dementia every 66 seconds. And although Alzheimer's disease is the sixth leading cause of death in America, in actuality, it is the third. And I'm going to, yes, question. I'm going to explain why, absolutely. And this is a big thing. So the CDC, which is the, the place that we get these, all these statistics of what people die from, um, they get these statistics from death certificates. So most people who die of dementia of any kind or Alzheimer's disease, it never gets listed on the death certificate. So therefore it is not being counted. So because as you heard in the video, Alzheimer's can stop your, your heart from beating. Alzheimer's can stop your ability to breathe. So on the death certificate, they'll put heart attack or maybe they have pneumonia, which is caused by Alzheimer's. So they don't put the underlying cause. So at Now Foundation, we actually wrote a law in the state of New Jersey that now mandates um, for hospitals, for, for hospice agencies, for coroner's office. If there is a diagnosis of dementia of any kind, it must be listed on the death certificate. Uh, we did that so that we can make these numbers count because guess what? If we were the third leading cause of death, I can guarantee you that we would have more money for research. Right? I can guarantee you that we would have more money for supportive services for our caregivers. So that's why we're fighting to make that happen. We are actually, advocacy is a huge part of the work we do. We are actually um, going to DC next month um, to rally. We have some appointments with some congressmen and some senators because we want to take this bill that we did here in New Jersey. We want to make it national. We want to make it a federal. And that's how we'll start to see these numbers change. We'll get more money. We get a fast, that way we can get on that fast track to finding a cure. So numbers matter, right? Always. Um, but New Jersey is the eighth state with the highest percentage of people of over the age of 65 living with Alzheimer's. Out of 50 states, we are number eight. We have more people over the age of 65 living with Alzheimer's than 42 other states. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, to be honest with you, the, the biggest risk factor is age itself. And we are all living much, much longer than we ever did before. So are we going to see more cases? Of course we are. 50% of people over the age of 85 will develop Alzheimer's disease, 50%. After the age of 65, it's one in eight. Yeah, 10% of all cases are under the age of 65 and only 5% of all cases are genetic based. So genes doesn't play into it as much. This is why I always tell people, you can go to 23andMe and you can get tested, you can get tested for the Alzheimer's gene, but I recommend you don't do it. Because just because you carry the gene doesn't mean you're going to develop the disease. So you know what happens? It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? 
oh my God, I have the gene, I have the gene, and you're gonna stress about it your whole life. And that might be the, the, the trigger that causes the onset of symptoms, or maybe it would do the complete opposite. Maybe you would completely change your lifestyle if you knew at the age of 20 that you have the, you have the genetic component for Alzheimer's. I don't know. I don't know what I would do, so I would really just rather not know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but here's some causes and risk factors. And as you can see, number one is age. Okay, these are not necessarily in any particular order, but age is a number one concern, okay? Family history and genetics, which we just talked about. Um, head injuries. So we're talking about all the NFL players. Muhammad Ali had Parkinson's-related dementia and Parkinson's. Um, all the NFL players that are constantly get, getting those concussions over and over again are developing Alzheimer's disease in their 40s and their 50s. So my mom's had five car accidents, five concussions. And I see it coming out now. So you have to really be careful with traumatic brain injuries. Um, high blood pressure. Typically, if high blood pressure is a risk factor, if you have high blood pressure in your, in your middle ages. So as we get older, and most of us will develop high blood pressure as we age, it's not such a big risk factor as it is if you were in your 40s or early 50s. So again, anything you have, if you can keep it under control and managed, then it shouldn't be such a risk factor. Heart disease is a huge risk factor. The heart and brain very closely related. Okay, so when we talk about anything that's heart healthy is brain healthy as well. Um, a poor diet, a stroke, smoking, alcohol use. We actually have, um, it's called Warnock, um, Warnock's, Warnock's disease, which is a dementia caused by alcohol by itself. So chron and I'm talking about chronic usage. I'm not talking about we go out on the weekends and we have a few drinks. I'm talking about chronic alcoholism can cause um, Alzheimer's. Uh, diabetes, of course, and depression. Diabetes, we actually refer to as type three, or we refer to Alzheimer's as type three diabetes. So again, what do you see in there, the correlation? It's that sugar intake um, that is a big problem for Alzheimer's. Just like cancer, less sugar, so does the brain. And it's an indicator it can cause damage to the brain. So we have Alzheimer's disease, we really sometimes call it type three diabetes just to sort of emphasize the importance of keeping your sugar levels under control. And depression, chronic depression, whether it's from when you're young or when you're older, chronic depression is a huge risk factor. People that are, are chronically depressed sort of isolate themselves from society, right? They don't have conversations. They're not using their brain. They're sleeping too much. Um, it's a whole cascade effect that over a period of years can actually that you can develop the onset of symptoms. Or here's a scary thing, because we all can have Alzheimer's right now in our brains as we sit here. You can develop 20, you can develop and start developing the disease 20 years prior to the first symptom evolving. So we can all have it right now. And if we are chronically depressed at a later stage in our life, we have a car accident, we get a head concussion, we lose a parent and we can't deal with the trauma, we're not able to cope, we're under a high level of stress. All of these things can um, bring out the onset of symptoms. So that's a little scary too. But again, it's all about learning how to cope with our life. Um, but we were talking about those two things that we can change to try to prevent it, right? And the number one thing is lifestyle. Um, and that's what we're gonna focus on. So the six pillars of brain health are all about lifestyle changes. And I know they're going to sound repetitive because these are the things you hear all the time. Eat right, workout, eat right, workout. It's like a lot of it's like a mantra, right? But it really can make a difference in preventing this disease. And the good thing is, it can also make a difference in preventing other chronic diseases, okay? So we're gonna talk about the first one. Know the benefits of exercise and physical activity. Just because we have to exercise doesn't mean we have to run a five mile marathon. Okay, it's literally about keeping the body moving. And of course, if we can get 30 minutes a day, five days a week, you're going to reduce your risk factor even more. But again, exercise is dependent upon your physical abilities. And so this is a question that I always have people talk to their doctor about to make sure, 
if you want to play tennis, well, you know, talk to your doctor and make sure you're physically okay to play tennis, or maybe you should just start walking. But it's about starting to work, um, get some sort of exercise in both aerobic and muscle. It's important that we build that muscle. It's really important as we age to build the strength in our lower bodies. Okay, our lower bodies is what holds us up all day. If we are weak in our limbs and our legs, we are at risk of falling, which we talked about a week or two, right, ago. We are at risk of falling. So strength as we age becomes more important in the lower half of your body. But also it's going to improve your mood, right? I know I feel better when I work out. I have more energy when I work out. You're gonna be more capable of doing more during your day, including building some cognitive strength. Um, it'll help manage and prevent some other diseases like heart disease, diabetes, okay? High blood pressure, high cholesterol, all of that can be reduced with a good exercise program. Um, more importantly, it'll help you sleep better at night. And as we age, we tend to sleep less. And as we're gonna talk about, sleep is another pillar um, of maintaining your good brain health. Helps reduce levels of stress. It can help us lose weight. And I also recommend that we keep on a pattern, get a routine going. Everything, I know when you're young, routine is not good. Like we hate routine. We wanna just get up in the morning and do whatever we want. I say we as if I'm young. <laughs> I'm gonna include myself in that. Uh, no. <laughs> but as we age, I'm also older. Um, as we age, routine becomes more important, okay? It becomes more important that we set, we get up at the same time, we have our breakfast, we do our exercise, whatever that routine may be, but we go to bed at the same time every night, okay? Um, and it can possibly improve or maintain some aspects of cognitive function, and it really can. There are um, more and more science coming out every day about the importance of not only sleep, but how exercise can improve our cognitive function. So they're getting, getting, they're getting more research about that, which is important. Um, six tips for helping a person living with dementia stay active. And this can become difficult. So when someone has dementia, not only are they losing their strength, right? Um, depending on what stage they're in, they're losing their ability to walk properly and stay physically active. They're also losing the will to do so. They'd rather just sit and do nothing. So it's really important that we try to keep them motivated. The sooner that we can get someone living with dementia on a regimen, the better it is. The sooner they'll stay with it for the rest of their life because it becomes part of their routine. Routine is important for someone living with dementia. It gives them purpose in life. They know what's coming next and they know that this is what they have to do and it makes them feel purposeful, which is really important. Um, so again, it could be taking a walk every day. It could be doing some little dancing. Music is also so important to the brain. It's incredible. Music for people who are, have lost the ability to speak. If you play their favorite song, they can actually start singing. So they might not be able to have a conversation with you, but they can sing. They also never lose yes and no and the curse words. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that is. And I think it's because that's like so ingrained, right? In our head, yes, no, and blank you. <laughs> that they don't lose, typically they don't lose that either. Um, but again, you always want to be realistic about how much activity your loved one can do. Never push them to do too much. Not only because of it can hurt them physically, but what happens if somebody with dementia, if they get pushed too hard or you say, come on, dad, you can do it. I know you can do it. Just keep, let's go one more block. Come on, I know you can. What's gonna happen is they're gonna get frustrated because they're tired, they wanna sit down or whatever, whatever's going on in their brain is telling them to stop and you're pushing them to go. That is going to be a trigger for a behavioral issue. Now, behavioral issues are just another word for communication. He can't tell you, hey, I'm tired. I want to go home. I'm hungry or I have to go to the bathroom. Can we just go home? And you'd be like, okay, dad, sure. He can't tell you that. So you know what he does is he just stops. And he can scream. He can sit down on the ground. He'll sit down on the bench. And you won't be able to get him up. He's trying to tell you something. Listen to what he's saying. All right? They can't speak to us the way that, that we do to each other. So pay attention to that. 
Um, you can also use uh, exercise videos or check online to see they have all kinds of things online on video. We have some things too. I did bring some physical activity booklets, I think, as there are over there. There are that have some good exercises the, that you can do at home. Okay. Um, make sure you always wear comfortable clothes and shoes that fit. Please don't go take someone with dementia out on a walk in flip flops. Okay. Because the name of the game with dementia is prevention. We have to learn how to prevent things from happening because if he falls, guess what you've just probably done? You've also triggered the onset of symptoms to progress. They can't recover from a fall like we can. So if they get very hurt, if they break a hip or they break a bone or they hit their head, they're not going to recover as quickly and you could have actually sped up their death. So it becomes about prevention, okay? Um, and obviously make sure that you guys, everyone's always drinking enough fluids and liquids. Okay. Here's my favorite one, sleep. We did a whole presentation on sleep a couple of weeks ago, right? And how important sleep is. There's no, but there's no sleeping in my class. <laughs> That's not allowed. Um, but a good night's sleep is really, really important. And as we learned a couple of weeks ago, you really need approximately seven to eight hours of sleep. You know, the, the sleep cycle goes through five stages and the last two stages are the most important of deep sleep, deep sleep and REM sleep. That, those are the stages when our brain is really um, repairing, our, our brain is being repaired, the rest is trying to repair the rest of our body. We're trying to recoup from the rest from the whole day. It's trying to flush out all those proteins and plaques you saw build, that build up in the brain in the video. At night, while we're sleeping in those two last stages is when the brain is naturally trying to flush out that protein and plaque buildup. So it becomes very important to stop, to try to stop um, the buildup of damage to the brain caused by lack of sleep. It's also important that we fall asleep within the first 30 minutes. So I don't mean that when you get into bed and you turn on the TV and you're like chilling on your phone and blah, 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 blah. I mean, once you turn that TV off, you set the phone down, we shouldn't even be we really shouldn't be watching TV or playing with our phone in bed at all, but that's difficult. So I really try to put the phone away, but I do, I do like to fall asleep to the TV. <laughs> but um, it's important that you try not to, but once you try to fall asleep, try to get to sleep within 30 minutes. Because if you don't get to sleep within 30 minutes, you're actually putting yourself at a 35% risk of developing dementia. So that ability to fall asleep is key to preventing dementia. Also, if you need to make sure you get at least, I know I'd say seven to eight, you have to get at least six hours. If you get anything less than six hours, you're increasing your risk factor by 24%. So actually, what, what, if you look at that, what's more important? Making sure you fall asleep within, within 30 minutes. But it's also important that you get only six hours. Question? I remember last, your last uh, yep. event you mentioned, when you go to sleep, you were, um, you know, I, I, I didn't think it was weird or funny. I, I thought it was interesting, right? Because when I go to sleep, I usually leave the television on. Sometimes I'll turn the volume all the way down, the TV's still going. Horrible. Right? I have a new one. <laughs> <laughs> I have a new one that keeps me up at night right now. Uh, well, even more reason for you to turn that TV off. Set it on a timer. Right. So I was thinking maybe we could do a sleeping exercise right now. You know? Okay. You, because you want to go to sleep right now. No, let's go sleep right no, now. No, but, but without, <laughs> yeah. without joking, is there any suggestions to maybe, you know, yes. pro, like, you know, get, gearing yourself to have a really good sleep? Absolutely. I mean, we, we always talk about not drinking alcohol before you go to sleep. I know people think you're going to drink a glass of wine or have a drink and it's going to make you fall asleep. It may make you fall asleep, but it's also going to make you wake up in the middle of the night. You're going to have a harder time getting to stage four and five of sleep. I thought you sleep. It does. You're going to, no, you're going to, it'll make you fall asleep faster, but you're, it'll wake you up in a couple of hours. So you're interrupting your sleep, which is very, it's not good. You're never, it, it also makes it harder for you to get stage four and five of, of deep sleep and REM sleep. So try not to drink any alcohol or caffeine at least four to six hours before you go to bed. Obviously, we don't do that every night, but just think, you know, just think as of overall the long haul, we need to do things like that. Try to set a sleep pattern where you go to bed at the same time, get up at the same time every morning. That'll help you fall asleep easier. 
Um, I also did, um, I don't think you were here during, oh, you were here during my sleep. So there's a, there's a trick that war veterans talk about that they use when they're in the field at war, whether they're on the front lines, you know, they have to sleep wherever they can sleep, right? So they have to learn how to fall asleep and what it is, it's a trick where you, and it takes practice. It's a trick where you just basically, you're, you're wherever you are, whether you're sitting, standing, laying down, it's about starting from the top of your head and physically saying to yourself quietly under your breath, you have to relax every muscle. So you're literally gonna talk yourself down to relaxing from your head. You're gonna relax your face. Sometimes we get tense. Sometimes I find myself like watching TV with like this tense look on my face. I'm like, stop it, wrinkles. You know, so I'm like, stop it. You have to, so you really have to physically tell yourself quietly to yourself to relax your facial muscles. And you move down the body, relax your neck, relax your shoulders, relax your arms, okay? Relax your stomach muscles, sink into the bed, relax your hips, relax your, your thighs, relax your knees, your calves, down your feet and down your little toes. And at the same time, you're trying to tell yourself to slow your breathing. Because you know, you can also, slow down the rate of your own heartbeat, which is helpful too. So people that have heart um, arrhythmias can, with this, with this routine, you can slow down your own heart rhythm, which will naturally slow down your ability to breathe. It'll slow down your breathing process. And you just go through this, this whole system. Once you've gotten it down, they say you can fall asleep within two minutes. Yeah. I, I, I guess it depends on how I, have pra I do practice this. It does work, it has worked for me. It's also about clearing your mind. So if you're someone who can learn how to meditate, meditation will help you learn how to clear your mind of outside thoughts and how to um, control your breathing at the same time. So it's a, it, it's a trick, it does work. It has been proven to work, but it takes practice. It's not something you're gonna learn overnight. But I suggest you do it, it really works. The biggest thing for me is, Clearing the day, clearing everything all for all you know all the stress that we're talking about. We have to clear that out of our brains. I mean, that's the hardest thing. But it, it can it can work. You're welcome. It does work though. Okay. And obviously we know how good we feel when we get a good night's sleep, right? We're on top of our game. We're faster. We have more energy. We're in a better mood. We're able to complete more more tasks than we can. And if we don't get enough sleep, we feel brain foggy, don't we? And chronic lack of sleep can affect so much. It can cause high blood pressure. It can cause heart disease, diabetes, obesity. People wake up in the middle of the night and want to eat. The last, the worst thing you could do. I also try to stop eating. If I'm not going out with anyone or I don't have a function or this, this, I stop. I try to stop eating after six. That's it. I'm not eating after 6 p.m. Yeah. So that your body has time to digest that food before you go to sleep. Um, doesn't always work. Depression and all, and, and, and depression, and of course Alzheimer's, which we've been talking about. So you had a huge risk factor for these things. So don't don't underestimate you, young people back there. I think you can survive on four to five hours. Well, you know what? You might not be as bright in class the next day. So it affects you too. You know, it really does. It just affects us older people a little more. <laughs> yeah. Socialization. Um, we underestimate the power, but I think we all learned our lesson during COVID, how, how horrific that was, not being able to talk to people person to person, right? To hold someone's hand or just touch them or to be hugged by someone. Um, we as humans, this is natural. This is how we, we have to engage with other people. We naturally want to do that. And so during COVID, that was all taken away. And so we had a huge onset of depression. Um, not only in young people, but a majority of the older population. We have a huge set. We had um, suicide rate for people over the age of 65 which skyrocketed because of lack of socialization. So don't underestimate the power of friends, of family, of engaging, okay? It can make you come to life. Um, and, and so it's really important. We are also then better able to cope with loss, right? It'll help us, having our friends next to us can help us get through that hard time. We can have, we have somebody to talk to. So it's really, really important that I, I tell everyone, if you don't, if you aren't engaged in the world at all, you young people are super engaged, which is great. Although younger people are less engaged now than ever because of technology, because of our phones. Everyone's on the phone all day long. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to engage with people on Instagram. 
or whatever. And <laughs> and Facebook right now. <laughs> Good point. But I mean, Facebook's great. <laughs> um, but anyways, but it's about still remembering that we have to engage with one another, okay? Not just through the phone, although that can be helpful. <laughs> um, mental stimulation, super important. Again, you young people, you're still learning. You know, what's great about, and why I, why I personally believe why Alzheimer's disease doesn't tend to affect the young so much is because the younger generations, they're constantly learning something new, right? They're constantly going through transitions in life you know you're aging you're going out of your teens you're going to college you're learning how to be, live on your own and you're going to get married then you're going to have kids and you're going to get a new job and all these things you're constantly growing okay so that's constantly keeping your mind active and then as we get older what do we do we retire and we stop engaging our brain so we really need to do the complete opposite we need to continue even if we're retired and to engage our minds and we, we try to set it. If you can do it at least an hour a day, it's going to be extremely beneficial. But here's the thing. I don't want you to just whip out a crossword book, you know, that's got 100 puzzles in it. And you can, know, I'm doing this for an hour a day. No, 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 no. It has to get slowly more difficult. You can't just whip out a book or read a, read a romance novel and think that that's going to engage your brain and you're going to continue to build new neurons. You're not. I mean, the best thing you can do is to learn a new language, right? So we can bump up our brain power in the language sector of our brain, learn how to play a musical instrument, which can be very difficult. Um, those two things in particular have the most benefits mm -hmm. and they're the most difficult thing to do, right? <laughs> um, but they do, they have the most benefits. So spend an hour of the day, but make sure it's difficult, not easy. This is not fun time. You know, yes, if you, can, if you can engage in the app and enjoy it, that's great. Um, you'll continue to do it. But, you know, get an app on the phone. They've got luminosity and all kinds of things that get progressively harder. So when you, you accomplish one level, you go to the next level. Those things are great. Okay. Um, key elements of healthy eating patterns. Again, a healthy mind diet can reduce your risk factor in developing the disease. And, and yes, it's hard. It's all, it's always too about moderation, but we do have to concentrate on what we call like the Mediterranean diet. So it's like green leafy vegetables. Um, you're limiting your amount of red meat. You're limiting obviously your amount of sugar. Um, you want to limit your healthy food choices, your beverage choices, trying to switch off of soda onto water. We do have a lot more healthy options now in drinks rather than drinking a soda. Okay, so we have to be very mindful and we've got a little bit of an idea inside your book that you do have a copy of this six pillars of brain health and the mind diet, which can actually reduce your risk factor by 35% alone. So even if tomorrow you said today, you wake up tomorrow morning, you're going to change one thing today. I'm going to improve one thing in my lifestyle and I try to eat healthier. Boom, you're going to reduce your risk factor by 35% if you make it part of your life, part of your lifestyle. So you need at least three servings of whole grains, a salad, and one other vegetable each day. It'll also help you poop, just saying. <laughs> Pooping also becomes very important when you get older, right? I don't, I'm not afraid to say it. <laughs> um, you can drink green tea daily. Green tea is great without sugar. Okay, I'm talking about national green tea, all right? Um, beans and legumes are at least every other day. Sweets, we really try to limit to five times a week. Okay, so everything in moderation. Fish at least once a week, but I'm talking about a fish that is um, high in omega threes. So I'm not talking about a white fish like tilapia or sea bass or something. I'm talking about salmon, I'm talking about mackerel, about sardines, about those types of fish that are very oily. Okay, they're high in omega threes, which is great for the brain. Um, poultry and berries at least twice a week. Listen. A cup of berries, a cup of berries a day keeps the Alzheimer's away. Um, when you talk about eating fruits, we do focus on the berry family because they're an antioxidant. They have a lot of high level of antioxidants and vitamin E, which fights the protein and plaque buildup in the brain. So that's why we, on all berries, I mean, every single berry you can imagine, just berries, berries, berries. Uh, and limit on healthy foods, cheese, of course, fried foods, no more than once a week. Oops. 
<laughs> um, and one tablespoon of butter a day, choose olive oil. Always choose an olive oil over a uh, any other oil. Or safflower oil is also a healthier choice too. Okay, definitely over butter. Again, these are things that we kind of already know. There's nothing new. I'm not, I'm not spouting any new information here. I'm just reminding you that this can be, make a difference. Okay. Um, and then the, the sixth one is what we talk about is mindfulness and spirituality. So, and you can take this in, in any way. People um, who are spiritual, um, religion, praying can be very helpful. But for those people who are not religious or not spiritual, it's about then maybe meditation, right? It's about de-stressing your life as best you can, which we kind of already talked about. And that could be done with Tai Chi. It could be done with yoga. It could be done with praying. Um, there are many different varieties that you can choose from. But it will also gain a new perspective on stressful situation. And most importantly, it helps you build skills to deal and cope with that stress. And that's what's important. And that meditation can also aid in your ability to sleep. So there's many, many benefits, okay? Lowers your blood pressure, right? Lowers your heart rate. You can get to sleep better. So it's, it has a lot of benefits other than just um, your brain, okay? Um, meditation may help people manage symptoms of conditions such as, of course, anxiety. Anxiety, asthma, cancer, chronic brain, um, when people get diagnosed with dementia or cancer or any chronic illness, meditation becomes part of their treatment plan. So I know it's not everybody's cup of tea, but it's definitely worth trying, okay? If you don't know how to start, we recommend the app Smiling Mind, smilingmind.com.au. Um, it's a great way to teach you very simply about the benefits of meditation, and it has meditation, short meditations, longer meditations, uh, but it teaches you step-by-step step how to develop the ability to meditate. Again, it takes practice. It's not something that's difficult for us to kick out the day out of our head. So this, mind, this app will help you do that. Um, and then again, what can you do today to change something? So out of all of those six pillars, mindfulness, socialization, sleeping, eating right, working out, de-stressing your life. Out of all of those things, pick one that you're gonna do something different tomorrow. If you're not working out, take a small walk, okay? Instead of eating that donut in the morning, grab a cup of berries, strawberries, you know? Those small changes add up. Start, instead of cooking with butter, cook with olive oil or safflower oil, okay? Those small changes, they really do make a difference. If there's a few steps that you can walk up rather than taking the elevator one floor, try that, okay? But one thing, all right, one thing. And write down what you will do and when. Sometimes people are very much, you know, if I write it down, I'm gonna make sure it happens. Depends on what kind of doer, what kind of learner you are. But I like to write things down. That way I know I'm going to make sure it gets done. Hopefully. And again, this is just how we can help. And I sort of talked about that in the beginning um, of the class. So again, the, if any of you have need any resources on anything that we've even talked about, the six pillars of brain health, uh, if you need resources with help for a family friend or a family member that is living with dementia, we're here to help um, and, and more than happy to do so. You can contact us. Our information is all over the blue packet that you have there. Um, does anybody have any questions? No? You guys were really great. I really appreciate it. Um, you will also see in your blue folder on the top of the right-hand side is a survey. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just answering a few simple questions, they're mostly, you know, yes or no. Um, and fill out the survey. You don't have to put your name on it. Be completely anonymous. Um, you can tell me how fabulous I was, or if I sucked. I don't know. <laughs> um, but let me know um, what you think about the materials you learned today. And again, guys, thank you very much. Thank you, Facebook. <laughs>